Okay. Okay. I see it's recording now. Yeah, we'll wait just a couple more minutes and see who else jumps in. There's Dennis Evans. I want to admit him. Maybe Alan Evans will uh, show up as well. David. Yes, sir. I've been cursing at him all day. <laughs> because of weeds? And why is that? Oh, for the... <laughs> well, it wasn't exactly weeds, but I've been trying to put some fence posts in, and I get down about two feet with the auger, and I hit hard pan and have to dig down about six inches more if I can, and if I don't, I just give up and cut the post off, but it's... <laughs> I've got blisters on my hands and it is you know. it's all Adam's fault yeah. yeah so anyway I'm getting some good out of the class anyway <laughs> I don't think he said keep and till I think he said keep until <laughs> until <laughs> that's a good one Siri it was Siri <laughs> Yeah, there's Alan Evans. Whoa, where's Alan Evans at? He's must be at you school. at school? Yeah. Am I turned off? Oh. No, you're on. Yeah, I've got an hour left of teacher conferences, <laughs> which I'm not doing. <laughs> I hope I don't get caught, you know, separate <laughs> church and state, stuff like that. You're in Oregon too, so it's worse. An hour left of teacher conferences. Dennis, did you look at that text I sent you, that pickup, Rick? I haven't got to it yet. I've been working, Alan. Did you guys see that? No. A pickup with pulling a trailer and an older couple, well, they're in their 60s, like Dennis. Um, oh. They their pickup went over the Malad Canyon oak bridge and only their safety chain was holding them. They hung there for an hour staring down at the canyon before they got them out of there. Two, two I, people and their dogs. I just had some people come and buy some pipe from, uh, oh, Oh, clear over on the east side of the state and they they went by and saw they saw that i didn't know what they meant right now is this a men's retreat study tonight well we ran oh. off uh biddy and marty leffler so it was that oh uh, there's marty marty's way <laughs> oh, there's marty it was that controversial women's issue thing uh yeah well we're not going to talk about men's and men and women where nobody and other women want to show up. <laughs> What's the matter, Marty? Did you not put on your makeup tonight? We're not getting to see you. <laughs> You're all still aware. You know, it's only it's only six o'clock here, so I'm still having dinner. Oh, it looks like you're in the <laughs> witness protection program. <laughs> uh, my husband is over there too, so he's oh. hiding as well. He's <laughs> over there. Okay. Marty and Keith, you need to come see us this summer. Well, we might. <laughs> I just said yesterday I want to see that house since you finished. Last time we saw it, it wasn't even started much. Well, and Dave and Lori are here now. You have twice. You, as you can stay. Yeah, you can stay with us. Yeah, I know. You can have that whole side of the house over there. <laughs> they, live on, they live on Corona Drive, though. Be careful. I know, I noticed that. I thought about that when I saw where they lived. Oh, well, I'm getting my second vaccine Saturday, so I'm all set. Next, uh, next Thursday for me. Not tomorrow, next Thursday. Is that your second one? Yes. Yeah. Even Michelle got um, a, an appointment. Good. So Lori's, we'll on some sort of, Lori's on some sort of list, but she's much younger. Yeah. Well, Michelle's not getting it because of age, so. Yeah. 
Oh, there's Maurice. Maurice had his first COVID shot, and I think he's got his second one coming up. So. Well, folks, it's uh, it's five after, so let's uh, let's go ahead and and uh, get started. Biddy will be here in a minute, I assume. But let me share my screen. There we go. Uh, Arvella is here. Let me admit her. Anybody got any uh, anything else they need to share? Well, let's uh, let's go ahead and talk about this. Um, let's talk about it. First thing we're going to do is is play our favorite new game show, and that is quotes from Jay. And uh, he had an excellent sermon this past uh, Sunday on restore. Let me uh, admit Charlotte now. Oh, I got to move this over. And uh, my quote was creation focuses on Jesus. Did anybody else have a quote from Jay that they wanted to share with the group? I didn't have a quote, but I noticed in the text that he had uh, read from Psalm 102, it talks about the creation. Yeah. Ever since I've been doing this study, Dennis, on, on uh, Genesis, I, I, it just impresses on me every time I see, they'll talk about God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, you know, or the, the, the creator. It, it, it just, it's more often than you know, just a casual reading without paying attention to that, uh, uh, that, that you would notice. Well, I want to talk about this quote from Jay first. I uh, will let him defend himself after I get through butchering what he uh, probably actually meant. But uh, <laughs> what did Jay mean by the idea that he said creation focuses on Jesus? Well, let me start, I think, is that, yeah, my objective of in, in, in reading Genesis, my objective in doing this class was really just to glean wisdom from Genesis itself. Uh, in other words, I haven't a lot, I've done it a little bit, but I haven't tried to, to bring in other scriptures or other uh, sources outside of Genesis. Just let, let Genesis speak for itself, almost as if we are, uh, you know, we're in, 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 in you know, 500 BC. Uh, it, this is before Christ has come. And so if you read it as a, as a Jewish individual, who, uh, who didn't, or, or, where Christ did not come, there's still good to get out of this, this thing. There's still wisdom uh, that, that we can glean from this thing. <clears throat> but the point is, is that there's limits to that because the Bible is a, is a very self-referencing book. When you read the whole thing, it references here, it references there. Uh, I mean, it's got cross references and notes everywhere. Even though the, the objective, one of the things I was trying to do with this class was just, let's just look at Genesis itself, all right? Let's, let's, let's not get into the whole, okay, compare Genesis to John and Genesis to anything else. And so, but when Jay says, creation focuses on Jesus, I wonder what he, what he really meant. And to, to do that, I want to just read Genesis 1, 1 through 3 again, and said, creation focuses on Jesus. Well, let's just read it. When it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. The Spirit of God was moving upon the face of the waters, 
And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Well, in one sense, in one sense, if you just read Genesis 1, 1 through 3, and you don't have any other book of the Bible to, to, to put in conversation with this first three verses, it's kind of hard to get Jesus out of that. It's kind of hard to get Jesus out of that. Uh, you can get God out of that. You can get the spirit out of that. But just looking at that, that's, that's what I'm saying here. I, I think Jesus is in there too. But if you just look at that, those first three verses, it's hard to get Jesus in it. Now, what you have to do, of course, is you have to reference it and read Genesis in light of the rest of history that we're familiar with. And the best one to look at in my, you can look at Hebrews as, as uh, Jay is doing, but the best one is probably John, Gospel of John, chapter one, verses one through five. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was, let's see, I think I might have somebody, no, didn't have anybody come in. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Uh, uh, he was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness shall not overcome it. Well, it's hard to read that one and say that Genesis 1 is not talking about Jesus because it says, in the beginning was the word, and right there is the first word. The first word that God said was, let there be light. And so if the word, and this is obviously what John is saying, is if the word is Jesus, then Jesus is the one that is speaking the word. Or you say, he was in the beginning with him. Well, right there it is, in the beginning. So if you can't read John and, 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 and see chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and not go back to Genesis and saying, he's saying Jesus was there from the very beginning. Or the light of men, the light shines in the darkness, and God said, let there be light. Well, he's talking about his son there. He's talking about the son. Uh, not the S-O-N, but the S-U-N, because the sun, the S-U-N, wasn't created until the fourth day. So if the sun wasn't created until the fourth day, then the light right here is it's referring to Jesus. It's referring to Jesus. The darkness, the darkness is there at the beginning, and it is Jesus that brings light to the world. So, Jay, that was my interpretation of your statement when you said creation focuses on Jesus. If you've got a swallower of your tea and can want to speak to that, uh, that's my tie into your sermon. So go ahead. Yeah. So I would just, um, I don't have much to add to that. Just, just to say that it's part of the way that Hebrew wants, Hebrews wants to launch. And that is you know, with this very, um, what I would say, a very high view of the Son of God. Um, and uh, in, in fact, the language is stronger in Hebrews even than in John um, in terms of Jesus' role in creation. And, um, uh, or I would say stronger than Colossians. Hebrews really pushes the boundaries. Mm -hmm. um, the interesting thing, though, for me, I'm sure somebody has probably written about this or something, but there's not an, we don't see an obvious linkage to know how the early church saw Jesus as involved with creation. I mean, that's a big thing. So I don't know if it's like they would have looked back at the story where Jesus and his disciples are on the lake and he calms a storm. Once they get to the end of this story, then they go back and reinterpret all that and say, well, he, he's master of creation, you know. Yeah. Um, they saw everything differently. I don't know. But, uh, but all of a sudden, I mean, the claims are big and across the New Testament about, about just that one thing, Jesus' role in creation, never mind other things. Yeah. 
Yeah, as, as I uh, as I read through the the, the, the interpretations of uh, the earth being without form and void and darkness on the face of the deep and the spirit of God moving over the face of the waters, a lot of commentators go straight to the story of uh, Jesus walking on water mm. and uh, mm. how he had control even of the water. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, again, that Jay was taking it in a direction that I'm not really taking this, this uh, study. Uh, I'm really trying, and I'm going to violate it a few times, but I'm really trying to just read Genesis for its own wisdom. You know, what can we get out of this particular story? And just study it intensely. And then, uh, and then uh, as you continue to read the rest of the New, you know, the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, you'll be surprised how many times people reference back to Genesis. And uh, Jay, you know, Jay did it uh, obviously there because it's part of Hebrews. It's part of the, the study that he's doing in Hebrews. Anybody else? Any other uh, comments about that? All right, now I'm going to violate something here. I'm going to introduce the lesson for tonight by, by pointing to Proverbs. I'm not just sticking to Genesis, but I, I was uh, just, I, I, I can't remember if I went to bed sleeping on it and waking up thinking about this, this quote from Proverbs. But uh, in Proverbs chapter 14, verses 12, it says, There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And I was thinking about that because what I really wanted to talk about tonight was two themes that I see now going all the way from Genesis 2-5 through 10-32. And, and tonight, I wanted to give just this broad overview. Uh, 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 you know, I'm not going to get too much into the story of Cain and Abel, but I'd like to get into that in the next week or two. I'm not going to get too much into the story of the city of Enoch, but I want to get into that. I'm not getting too much into the story of the flood. I'm not gotten to the Tower of Babel yet either, but I, I want to give a broad overview of these two things, uh, of, of this, 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 this section of scripture, 2, 5 through 10, 32, uh, essentially from the beginning of the second creation narrative up to the Tower of Babel. When you, when you do that, there's lots of themes. There's lots of themes. I'm not saying these are the exclusive themes, because if there's anything that I've learned from studying Genesis over these last four or five years is that there's lots of things. This is, this is deep literature where you can get a lot of different things out of it. But at least two that I think show up uh, through here is I call it the march of death and the work of God. The march of death starts with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we talked about that last time where it probably just represents the idea that as human beings, we have the ability to think and choose. And yet if we rely on our own thought process, if we just rely on ourselves and think that we can make decisions for ourselves, we're going to end up choosing things that are not going to turn out well for us. And it certainly didn't turn out well for Adam and Eve. And so that's the tree of knowledge. What I want to talk about today, we talked about right at the end of the class last time, and that's the death of the animal. Poor little deer had to die in order for, uh, for, a, uh, for garments of skin to be made for Adam and Eve. I want to talk about the death of a brother. That's obviously Cain and Abel. I want to talk about the first philosopher of death, and that's Lamech from the line of Cain. And then I want to talk about the flood where we had almost total death. All right, so this theme of death and evil and violence kind of pervades Genesis 2 verse 5 through 10 verse 32. But at the same time, at the same time, when you have this, this, this very, very sad, depressing, you know, bad things happening, 
at the same time, you've got the work of God. God is right there. He's imminent. He's right beside us. And he's working, trying to get us to choose the good. So as soon as you have a tree of knowledge, you also have the tree of life. There are two, two, two right there by side by side. I don't know if they were side by side in the garden, but uh, you know, they, 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 those are the two trees that were mentioned. Only two, only two trees. You've got the death of the animals, but at the same time, they made garments of skin. Garments of skin for Adam and Eve because they were naked and they knew it and their poor little fig leaves weren't doing any good. All right. You had the death of a brother. You know, Cain was able to kill Abel. Okay, is the, uh, is the way I memorized it when I was a kid. Cain was able to kill Abel. And then at the same time, you've got God providing counsel to Cain. God's right there talking to Cain. Say, hey, watch what you're doing. He doesn't prevent him from doing it. He doesn't stop him from doing it, but he talks to him. He counsels him, just like God does today. God doesn't prevent us from doing something, but he's there talking to us and counseling us. You've got the first philosopher of death, the poet of death, the, uh, the, the man Lamech. And then you've also got the philosopher of life, the other Lamech, which we'll, we'll distinguish between Lamech and Lamech here in, in a few minutes. You've got the flood, which represents total death of almost all creation. But then you've got God providing, saving creation through the uh, ark, saving Noah and his family through the ark. And so you get, you get this theme, these two themes of, of human beings making bad choices, leading towards death, and God right beside us, trying to help us, trying to pull us along, trying to say, no, that's a bad idea. Have you thought about doing it this way? God is, is constantly at work, and I, I use that word work deliberately because that's the word that God certainly used for himself in the first chapter of Genesis when he was uh, creating, uh, creating the world for us to live in. So that's going to be the theme tonight. I, 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 I'm, I'm concentrating a little bit more on the march of death. I, I hopefully next week I'll come back and talk more about the work of God, because, but uh, anyway, the way I started thinking about this and, and putting it together, I, I tended to emphasize the march of death just a little bit more. So let's talk about the garments of skin. Garments of skin, my second favorite verse in uh, the first part of Genesis. We remember that Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves with fig leaves. They tried to do it. By the way, it's also an interesting study to, to look and see how many times fig trees are mentioned in the Bible. It's, it's mentioned over and over again. Have no idea why, but you got the first tree that was ever named as a fig tree, and then you have Jesus cursing the fig tree, and, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of deals with fig trees. I'm not exactly sure why. God makes them garments of skin. So I wonder how that happened. How did God make them garments of skin? How did he do that? We don't know, but it's, it's an interesting thought experiment. Did God actually show them the technology of tanning? All right. Who killed the animals to make the skins? I don't know, but it is my second favorite verse in the first three chapters of Genesis. Let's think about this in terms of how could this have happened? Kind of like uh, back in the very first chapter, how did God create the heavens and the earth? Did he create it ex nihilo or did he create it ex profundus? So let's just go through a thought experiment. Just, just, let's just think about it for a while. How did God provide Adam and Eve with garments of skin? God went through what process? How did he do this? This is why, by the way, we need novelists. <laughs> Novels are good things. I, uh, I, I, I'm not a big novel reader. I need to read more novels, but a novelist could just have a field day with this thing about thinking about the process from when God uh, drove them out of the garden and then when he made them garments of skin. First off, God could have created this clothing ex nihilo. Okay, to refer to a term that we used over the first uh, 
a uh, few chap, few verses. If God had wanted to, he just could have said, garments of skin for these two, all right? He could have spoken and they would have appeared. I, I don't discount that. If that's the way you want to think that God created these uh, garments of skin for Adam and Eve, you go right ahead. That's fine with me. It's not a matter of faith. It's just a matter of thinking through it. It could be that God killed the first deer or cow. It just says skins. doesn't say deer skin, but that's the way I always think of it. could be that God killed the deer. And God himself went through the tanning process, the cutting process, the sewing process, showing how it's done. Otherwise, Adam and Eve would have never known how to do it, would have never figured it out. So maybe God showed them, but God himself killed that first couple of deer in order to get the buckskins that he provided for Adam and Eve. It could be that God had Adam kill the deer. And he talked to Adam as he walked Adam through the process. No, you got to kill it. You got to strip it. You got to strip it off its uh, the hide, hide off the, 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 the meat. And uh, then you got to you got to scrape the fat off the inside. And then you got to, you know, you got to do this. You got to do that. It's a stinky, messy process. Uh, you know, uh, and, and, and he did it. And I wonder, I wonder, was Eve standing there watching the whole thing? Was Eve just standing there watching her poor man have to kill a deer that this be wandering around and, you know, very happy little deer until God said, well, first thing you got to do to make garments of skin, you got to kill a deer. You know, what, what was Eve's reaction to that? I have no idea. It's just a thought. But if he had to it, that's the death of the animals. The animals had to die. And it is the first disturbance in what's known as the peaceable kingdom. And so there's death now. Did Eve herself have any idea this would be the consequence of eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Did Eve even think about that? Probably not. And of course, the lesson for you and me is we have, there are consequences to our sin that we had no idea about. We had no idea that because I did this thing, that really hurt this person over here, that hurt this thing over here, that, you know, we, we, it's why, it's why that, that uh, we, we've got to pay attention to what God tells us to do because God is pointing us toward life and we tend to point towards death, even the poor little deer with his feet chopped off and the rope around his neck. And I'll go ahead and move off of this picture. Okay. Any, uh, any comment about uh, that part of it? I can go backwards a little bit if you want me to, but uh, anybody got anything? I interpret that scripture as being one of wonderfulness of God wanting to take care of Adam and Eve, but at the same time helping them understand that these are the consequences of the sin that you guys have been committed. Okay. All right. Immediately after, and uh, the, the garments of skin were on in chapter three, three verse uh, 20 something, 22, 21. Chapter three, verses, verse 21, when God made garments of skin. Then immediately starting in chapter four, we have the story of Cain and Abel. Uh, I, I think I'll 
probably go back and mine some of the depth of the wisdom from the details of the story of Cain and Abel, but we all know the overview of it. I mean, uh, Eve uh, uh, had two kids, had Cain, and then uh, they had Abel, and Cain was a farmer, and Abel was a herdsman, and in the due course of time, they came to offer their sacrifices to God. <clears throat> Again, a very rich story that I'm, I'm not glossing over here, but, uh, you know, who told them to sacrifice anything? This is the first mention of sacrifice in the Bible, and it just says they brought their sacrifices. It doesn't say why. It doesn't say that God commanded them to do it. it just said they brought their sacrifices. And why did God find one sacrifice acceptable and he found the other one not acceptable? Well, there's, there's hints as to why, but it's certainly not obvious. There's a, a great deal of debate that you could have as to why one was acceptable and the other was not. And there's some riches in there that we need to think through. But again, this, this idea of Cain deciding that his brother had to die is the consequence of Cain deciding this on his own. Cain just made the decision. God counseled him against it, just like his mama and his daddy decided they were going to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And even though God told him not to, even though God counseled Cain not to do this, of course, uh, he, he killed his brother. And maybe, 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 probably, I lean this way. Cain is the reason why God told Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God knew he was going to have to kill a deer. God knew that they would have two boys and one of them would, would kill the other one. I mean, God is, 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 uh, is, is transcendent. His knowledge transcends these things. And he's imminent. He's, he's there beside us all. And uh, God knew that this would be part of the, uh, the, the, the knowledge of good and evil is people would use it for their own and they wouldn't listen to him and death would be the, the result thereof. And again, you got to put yourself in the, in the place of Adam and Eve. That's why we need novelists. We need novelists because uh, how did Adam and Eve feel about this? The Bible is silent. The Bible doesn't say anything. After, after Cain is born, uh, Eve never speaks again. And Adam kind of receded into the background after uh, the garden. Uh, uh, Eve doesn't even give Adam any credit for uh, her having a son. You know, she said, I, 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 I got a son with the help of the Lord. Well, probably Adam had something to do with it, but she wasn't ready to give him any credit for it. And uh, we need to talk about that a little bit. So there's this, this, this theme with the death of the animals, the death of a, a, of a brother, and it continues, this theme of death. And to get to the theme of death, ah, this is one of my, I, I spent a lot of time on this, and I hope you guys appreciate this, okay? But I want to talk about the generations all the way from Adam to Noah. All the way from Adam to Noah. And you notice I put across the top right here, one, Adam is the first generation of human beings. When we get all the way over here to 10, this will be Noah down here at the, at the bottom. So there's 10 generations from Adam to uh, Noah. Okay, here we go. Everybody knows the second generation. Who were the three sons of Adam? Well, there was Seth, there was Cain, and then there was Abel. Okay? Now, they had Adam and Eve had lots more sons and daughters, it tells us, but none of the rest of them are named. And certainly, don't, we don't get the genealogy of any of the other sons of uh, Adam and Eve, but, but these are the three. Now, I'm going to put a line right down the middle between Seth and Cain, so everything above the line are the sons of Seth, 
everything below the line are the sons of Cain. All right? Y'all ready? <laughs> this is all in Genesis chapter 4, toward the end of the chapter, where it lists the sons of Cain. And then Genesis chapter 5, where we get the sons of Seth. So Seth had a son. His name was Enosh. Enosh. Then Cain had a son. His name was Enoch. Enoch. Very closely related names, but uh, two different names. So that's the third generation. Third generation. Fourth generation. Enosh, son of Seth, uh, uh, son of Seth, had a boy. His name was Kenan. Enoch had a son. His name was Arad. I, I'll, I'll say Arad. Remember, I grew up in Arkansas. My pronunciation is probably not correct. We need a Canadian to give us the correct pronunciation of things. But, uh, you know, there it is. Kenan and actually in Arkansas, we call that Irad. Okay. Irad, the son of Enoch. Fifth generation. Fifth generation. Kenan had a son named Mahalalel. Irad, Arad, had a son named Bajujael. Okay. Pardon any pronunciation errors. Sixth generation. Mahalalel had a son named Jared. Got that one. Bajujael had a son named Methushael. Not to be confused, by the way, with Methuselah. Methushael is in the line of Cain. Methuselah will show up here in a couple of seconds from the line of Seth. Seventh generation after Jared and Methushael is always important. Seven, you guys know, seven is a, is a unique number uh, unique. I mean, anytime there's seven of something, you got to pay attention to the seventh of anything. And certainly we need to pay attention to the seventh in the line of Adam. And so uh, Jared had a son named Enoch. And Methuselah had a son named Lamech. Lamech. Now, we need to pause on these two guys. These two guys are important. Both Enoch and Lamech. Anybody remember why Enoch is important? Enoch from the line of Seth. He never died an earthly death. That's exactly right. Enoch walked with God. And, and it's, it's obviously a reference back to the, the, to the garden where God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the evening, my first favorite verse in, uh, in Genesis, first few chapters. And so Enoch also walked with God. And God just took him. Enoch lived 365 years. Have no idea if it's significant that Enoch lived the same number of years as there are days in a year, probably not, maybe so, I don't know, there's, there's no insignificant things in, in, the, in the Bible, but Enoch, the seventh now, the seventh one, the, perf the, the fullness, the fullness of the line of Seth, you have a person who walked with God and God took him. So Enoch represents that line of people whom God was pleased with so pleased that he did not condemn him to death, all right? The rest of us are going to have to die, but Enoch, one of the two people that, that, that God just took, all right? The other one was, I didn't study this, it just occurred, Elijah or Elisha? Which one? Elisha, right? Didn't know, he took Elisha? Elijah? Okay, all right, one of the two. Whenever I get to that study, I'll, uh, I'll remember it. But uh, yeah, Enoch was one. Lamech, on the other hand, Lamech down here, seventh in the line from Cain, represents the fullness of evil, the complete uh, 
manifestation of bad choices and doing things on your own. And so you have this comparison of Enoch to Lamech, all right? So let's push a little bit more. Enoch, from the line of Seth, had a son, and his name was Methuselah. Methuselah is the one we all remember from Bible class back in uh, junior high or grade school, whatever it is. Methuselah was the, uh, the man who lived the longest, 969 years. Well, he was the son of Enoch, the man who did not die. Right? On the other hand, you have Lamech right here, and he had three sons, Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal-Cain otherwise known as Huey, Dewey, and Louie, okay? But, uh, you know, Jobble, Jubal, and Tubal. So uh, you have, you had three sons of Lamech, whom we will talk about. We'll get to Jobble, Jubal, and Tubal uh, uh, in, in a lesson some weeks into the future. Not exactly sure when. All right. Methuselah, going back up here, Methuselah had a, uh, a son, and his name was Lamech. Can't tell the players without a program, folks. Uh, you you got to keep all these, these guys straight. But Lamech from the line of Cain is very different from the Lamech from the line of Seth. Lamech from the line of Seth is ninth, and Lamech from the line of Cain is seventh generation. Seventh generation Lamech right here, ninth generation Lamech over here. Lamech is important because he is the philosopher of life. He's the philosopher of life. That's my term. I didn't get that out of any commentary. Okay. And Lamech, of course, was the father of Noah. Lamech was the father of Noah. There's all sorts of interesting things to look through on this, this, this slide. There's all sorts of interesting, at least to me, comparisons that you can make. For example, you can compare Enoch right here to Enoch over here. Enoch from the line of Cain versus Enoch from the line of Seth. It's, it's an interesting comparison to draw if you just compare those two people. It's interesting to compare Enoch from the line of Seth with Lamech from the line of Cain because they're both seventh. They're the seventh generation, and they've got some comparisons that are made there. And I'm not going to do either one of those today. Hopefully, I'll get to it, uh, you know, sooner or later. The one that I want to talk about is comparing the two Lamechs. Comparing the two Lamechs. That's what I want to do today. I've just got a few more minutes but that's where I want to go with this thing. I want to compare Lamech from the line of Seth versus Lamech from the line of Cain. Two men, two men, both named Lamech. Both of them named Lamech. There's Lamech, seventh in the line of Cain. Boo, okay? There's Lamech, ninth in the line of Seth. Yay, okay? Lamech, seventh in the line of Cain, boo. Lamech, ninth in the line of Seth, yay. Okay. Lamech, seventh in the line of Cain, is found in Genesis 19, verses uh, Genesis 4, 19 through 24. Lamech, from the line of Seth, is found in Genesis 5, verses 28 through 31. Interestingly, Lamech, is the son of Methushael. Lamech from Seth is the son of Methuselah. I am not a Hebrew scholar nor the son of a Hebrew scholar, but I bet there's some interesting contrast between Methushael and Methuselah, which we will not get into because I don't know anything about it. Lamech from the line of Cain was the son of Jabal, Jubal, and Tubal, Huey, Dewey, and Louie. Okay. Lamech from the line of Seth was the father of Noah. 
Lamech from the line of Cain was the first recorded polygamist. For the first time in the Bible, there is a person with multiple wives. Lamech from the line of Seth only had one wife. As far as we know, actually, there's not any mention of uh, Lamech's wife at all. Lamech from the line of Cain was the very first poet recorded in the Bible. Lamech from the line of Seth was the second poet recorded in the Bible. Lamech from the line of Cain is the philosopher of death. Lamech from the line of Seth is the philosopher of life. There's probably more comparisons that we can do, but it's just fascinating just to study these two guys and mine the Bible for all the comparisons that we can make. What I want to do, and I knew I'd probably run out of time, I just want to look at their poetry. I want to look at the poetry of Lamech, seventh line of Cain, and I want to look at the poetry of Lamech, ninth in the line of Seth, all right? And then we'll kind of draw it to a close. First one, Lamech, seventh in the line of Cain, seventh in the line of Cain. And here is his poem. This is, by the way, in uh, Genesis chapter 4, verses 23 through 24. Now, before I put it up there, like all poetry, it loses something in translation. This is uh, ancient Hebrew poetry. It's not English poetry. And anytime you try to translate poetry, it kind of loses a little bit. But uh, I think there's enough in this poetry that, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that, that it's useful to study. By the way, this is a, a stock photo, just Googling it, Lamech. And the reason that he's got this sword right here is because the term that the scholars use for this is the Song of the Sword. That's the, 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 the title that uh, the, uh, the, the Hebrew scholars have given to this. And uh, we'll get into this later on, but Tubal, remember, was his son Tubal was a worker in metallurgy. He worked in uh, 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 bronze and iron. And the assumption is that he made swords. And so he gave some of these swords to his father named Lamech. Here it is. It consists of two uh, excuse me, three series of two couplets. There's three of two couplets, three verses, two couplets each of the three verses. The first uh, sentence is, Adam and Zilla, hear my voice. Adam and Zilla are, of course, Lamech's two wives, the first polygamist. Adam and Zilla, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, Hearken to what I say. By the way, every now and then I will, I will say this. You wife of David, hearken to what I say. It doesn't go well, okay? Hey, you wife of David, hearken to what I say. And, and if, if there's anything that you shouldn't do would be to say, hearken to my voice. So uh, I'm telling you, it just doesn't work well. But that's what he said. Ada and Zilla, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, hearken to what I say. And as we read this thing, we get at least two, this first couplet, we get at least two ideas of what's going on here. The first one is this guy is arrogant. This guy is, is, is uh, there's an intensity about his arrogance. He doesn't just say, hey, Adam and Zilla, I've got something to say. You know, I, I, I got something I need you to hear. No, it's Adam and Zilla, hear my voice. And then he says it more intensely, more intensely. There's an intensity to it. You wives of Lamech, hearken to what I say. It's a, there's a, there's a, fervor to it. I mean, this is an intense guy, a very, very intense guy. 
Second couplet. I have slain a man for wounding me. A young man just for striking me. All right. Again, there's a he's he's saying, he's saying, yeah, you know, somebody, somebody, somebody stabbed me a little bit. Man, I just killed him. I killed the guy. This is not an eye for an eye. This is a a a death for a for a wound, you know. Uh, there, I got I got a little wound here. We got in a fight. He hit me. I got bleeding a little bit. I just killed the dude. All right. But then you read the second line, and I said, "Hey, I killed this kid." He is kind of brushed up against me. He struck me, yeah, but I, I, I killed him too. I killed him too. And so it's not that his brother offended him. It's not that, that, that you know, there's anything that's horribly bad, but Lamech is laying it all out. You better not touch him. You better not touch him. You better not bother Lamech because he's going to take matters into his own hands and he's going to get back at you. He is a revengeful, vengeful person. All right. Finally, the third couplet. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech 77fold. Remember, Lamech's the seventh in the line from Cain. He knows his great, 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 great grandfather. The story of Cain had been made known through the line of Cain. And so Lamech knew that God, God had protected his great, 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 great grandfather. And God will avenge anybody that, that hurts Cain. In fact, God will do it seven times over. Lamech is saying, I'm going one better than God. I'm not going one better than God. I'm going 77 times better than God. He's taking upon himself. He's taking upon himself to avenge the slightest slight that anybody might have put against him. All right. And so we have here in the line of Lamech, this, this mean, intense philosopher of death, philosopher of death. And let me make one other point and I'll open it up for anything else anybody wants to say about this little piece of poetry because I think this piece of poetry is why, is, is the ultimate reason why God sent the flood. This is why God sent the flood. Let's tie these last two couplets to the first couplet. The first couplet, he's saying, you wives of Lamech, you need to listen to what I say, and I want you to teach this to my children. Why is he addressing this thing to his wives? Why is Lamech addressing this poetry to his wives? Why not just to his enemies? Well, he's addressing it to his wives because he wants his wives to teach his boys that this is me. This is my philosophy. You don't let anybody even come close to touching you. You don't let anybody come close to bothering you. You take it upon yourself to avenge for yourself. He is the opposite of the person who says, you know, when God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. No. Lamech is saying, vengeance is mine. Vengeance belongs to Lamech. This is what I want to do. That's my interpretation of this little piece of poetry. Actually, none of that's mine. I got it out of a couple of research articles. But uh, any comments on the, the poetry of Lamech, the Song of the Sword? I can be a little bit more uh, positive when we get to the other Lamech, if you want to move on to him. <laughs> this, is a, this is a dark poem, folks. 
This is a really, really dark, 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 dark poem. All right, we'll move on. Now we have a poem by Lamech, ninth in the line of Seth. I could not find any sort of representation of uh, Lamech. Anytime you Google Lamech, father of Noah, all the things that come up are a picture of Noah. So I, I, I really couldn't find one of, uh, of Lamech. Here's Lamech's poetry. Out of the ground, which the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from the toil of our hands. And of course, who is Lamech talking about when he says, this one shall bring us relief? Noah, yeah. Because remember, Lamech from the line of Seth is the father of Noah. It's like he's holding up his young son, Noah, all right? Uh, you know, he's, he's, you know, on the eighth day, uh, they weren't circumcised back then, but, uh, you know, whenever it came time for, for, for Lamech to hold his son in his arms, he holds him and he, he, he offers up this prayer to God. Out of the ground which the Lord has cursed, this one shall bring us relief from the toil of our hands. This is not an ode to ego. This is a prayer to God that God will use his progeny, not as an instrument of death, but, but God will use the progeny of Lamech as an instrument of life, of life, of relief, of, uh, of, of, of doing things good. All right. um, anyway, I've already kind of done some of this, but we can compare these two pieces of poetry Lamech from the line of Cain versus Lamech from the line of Seth. The poetry of Lamech from the line of Seth, it centers on Lamech. It's an ode to ego. It's an ode to himself. Lamech from the line of, uh, oh, I, I went ahead and did it this way. It's, it's screaming, listen to me, you wives of Lamech, hearken to what I say, listen to me. There's an intensity of progression in each of the couplets. It, it just becomes more intense in, in, in all the couplets. It's the full fruition of the sin of Adam and Eve when they chose of their own free will to eat of the good of the, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This is the this is the end result. You got uh, this this self-centered egotist saying, I'm going to decide on my own. I'm not going to let anybody else do anything. I will protect myself even more than God protected Cain. He's, he's, he's not only putting himself in the place of God, he's extending. He's, he's more intense than God. I will harm others who barely even threaten me. You just look at me wrong. I'm going to take you out. I will decide what I think is best. It is an ode to ego. The poetry of Lamech from the line of Seth, it's acceptance of God's reality. You know, we live in a, in a world where it has cursed ground. We pray for relief. Maybe you'll provide us relief through this son that has been born to me. It's a prayer of hope. You know, please give us this. Uh, it's a prayer for the future. It's a prayer not for self, but for others and others of future generations. It's a prayer to God. It's not a prayer to his self. And the question then is, whose poetry, whose philosophy will prevail in the world? Will the poetry of Lamech of Cain or will the poetry of Lamech of Seth? Which one of these two is going to be more predominant? And it's eight o'clock. I don't think I even want to go to my next slide. But the flood provides the answer. The flood provides the answer of which poetry prevailed in the ancient world. Let me just stop right there. I, I, I don't want to go too far, and I've been talking the whole time. So let me just unshare. No, 
help. I've got it on my screen now. Anyway. What do y'all see now? Do y'all see my do y'all see me or everybody else or do you see my PowerPoint? We see you. Bye bye. <laughs> okay. Thank you, uh, Marty and Keith. All right. I didn't plant any questions in this one. I need to do that next time. David? Yes, sir. I think there's something that I have kind of missed in the past readings of Genesis. I think be, through this, uh, the, these two poems and reading these, this genealogy, I think you see that God was still active with his children and trying to bring them. It, it didn't just stop with Adam and Eve or Cain and Abel and then jump to Noah. God was continually trying to bring his people to do the right thing. Because you can see that through Enoch. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you can see it through um, Lamech, um, Noah's father. Yep. And so God was, you know, trying to, to bring them back or yeah. keep them on the straight and narrow or whatever. Yeah, I mean, after reading these first 11 chapters and studying them for quite a while, the scripture, uh, one of the scriptures that, that has more meaning for me was when Jesus said, uh, I, I, uh, my father is at work and I am at work. I forget mm -hmm. where it is. Uh, John, I think. I think it's in John. But yeah, I mean, God's working here. You know, God is active and uh, he's active through these genealogies because he's blessing Enoch. You know, he's active through this genealogy because here it is. They're the 10th uh, generation from, from Adam is this, this man, Noah, and, and he, he sees them and he, he recognizes them and he blesses them. And he, through you, I will, uh, you know, I will say that it wasn't the same. God, God didn't save, God didn't fulfill Lamech's line of Seth. God didn't fulfill Lamech's prayer in the way that Lamech answered it, uh, asked it. You know, Lamech asked that, please use my son to relieve us from the toil of our hands. Okay. I mean, that was his prayer. And God didn't answer it that way, but the God did use his son to, to, uh, to, to save humanity. Okay. Kind of like when we pray for one particular thing, and uh, God doesn't grant that one particular thing that we prayed for, but he did something else that was great that, that, uh, that we should appreciate even more. So it's understandable why um, a story like uh, Cain and Abel is taught to kids because, you know, it's simple. It's easy to get a hold of. Kids get it. Um, but it, 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 it just seems to me it's too bad that people aren't more familiar with the Lamech story because that really does show the, the accumulated effect of that. Yeah. Um, you know, um, harder to teach to children, but it does really kind of bring things to a climax to see where this ends up. Yeah. Yeah, when I first started studying this stuff, I, I didn't realize there were two different Lamechs. I mean, I, I'm embarrassed. I mean, I, I, I was probably about 60 years old. And I hadn't read it closely enough to realize, oh, 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 there's two different ones. Okay, I mean, there, there, there's this Lamech and then there's this other Lamech. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's, it's embarrassing now to, to confess that, but I just, I didn't realize there were two different ones. And have you read Jesus, uh, people talking about Jesus undoing this story? No, I haven't read that part. Where okay. Peter says, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times. And Jesus says, no, 77 yeah. times. So he playing yeah. with the same numbers, right? But yeah, okay. But, yeah, but that's what you're talking about. Too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Takes yeah, it, it's interesting how much echoes there are in the New Testament of these sort of stories. 
of these stories. Biddy? The whole class was so far over my head, I'm having difficulty coming up with even a smart ass remark, so sorry. <laughs> Now, I, I think the last question you asked was, you know, where do you think how to take a picture of the screen or I knew I'd forget, you know, what, where do we think, oh, what was your question? What was going to be the outcome? Yeah. And I, I mean, it was almost as if it was futuristic. It's like, well, right here, right now, what do you, what do you think? Right. It's going to be this egocentric, um, on the line of Cain you know that's how it's playing out right now but in the end because I read ahead <laughs> that's the best news of all is that you know the good guy always wins yeah and yeah. that brings peace at least for now and gives breathing room to help more others I mean that's I think the, the bottom line is to help as many into the boat as possible yeah, I don't. Bruce just explained to me the story of the tares, the wheat and the tares. Uh -huh. And, you know, everywhere I'm hearing that, you know, we have to separate the wheat from the tares. And that's not what it says. It says we don't do that. We let them grow. Yep. And at, in the very end, God will send someone to sort it out. We're not in the uprooting business we're in the growing and cultivating and helping people produce fruit by producing fruit of our own but anyway it just made a big impression on me because you can get really beat up by people that i guess think that it's you know like it's our job to do the separating yeah. and the judging and who's in and who's out and that's that's so the opposite of what i'm learning and is really going on good Good. Yeah, I, I view this uh, the, the, uh, related to that, Biddy, is, uh, <clears throat> you know, God is always right there. Yeah. I mean, he's right there. He's encouraging us like he encouraged Cain. You know, he's, he's rewarding those who believe in him like he did Enoch. You know, he's comparing and contrasting like the two Lamechs. And all of that is to try to convince us that we need to make choices for life, you know, for, for, the, for the path that, that he would have for us and not, and not the path that we would choose for ourselves. You know, we, we've got to, we, we can't just rely on what we think is best right now. And that's not saying we, you know, we, we need to have sound judgment and all that sort of stuff, but it's an informed judgment. Yeah. Dan, uh, Dennis, other Dennis? No. Jim? Charlotte? Anybody? Well, thank you everybody for coming tonight. I appreciate it. We'll go and do this probably, Jay and I were talking just a few minutes ago, uh, we're not for sure, but we'll probably do this through the end of April. We'll probably keep on with Genesis for about six more Wednesday nights, and then y'all will be tired of me and I'll be tired of doing it, and, uh, and we'll probably just cut it off about that time and do either, uh, you know, maybe in the building by then, we may, uh, or we may just continue it on Zoom, I mean, who knows, uh, but we'll probably do this through, uh, through the end of uh, April. And then uh, that'll get, probably get us through the Tower of Babel at least. So uh, I got another I cool slide that shows the generations from Noah through uh, Abraham. So uh, kind of have a diagonal sort of thing going on. I got another one that shows the, uh, the ages, you know, in uh, Genesis chapter five, it lists all the ages of everybody. And I've got a slide that shows when everybody died and who they could have known and uh, who they could not have known. So anyway, that'll be in the next couple of weeks.
Appreciate all the time you put into it, David. Thank oh, you. Oh, it's fun. It's fun. Yeah.